Well, good morning and welcome to the CEO podcast with Washington Hospitality Association President and CEO Anthony Antone. Today, Anthony will discuss the recent legislative session with our Senior Government Affairs Director, Julia Gordon. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A section of your Zoom screen. And we are recording this. It, we will have it up on our YouTube channel and as a podcast later on today. Thank you very much to our sponsor, Adesso. And now here is Anthony. Hey, a live podcast. It has been forever since we've got to talk to all of you live. But with session just getting out, we wanted to give everyone a chance to be able to ask us questions. And so let's just kind of check in. Um, we're right at 10 o'clock. Uh, Lisa, should we give everyone a chance to kind of log in here for the first couple of minutes? Sure, we can do that. I think let's, let's give everyone just a minute or two to get logged in for the 40 or so RSVPs we have to join us live. And then, of course, a couple of hundred who will listen to this later in the recorded version. Um, but as we're giving people a chance to log in. Uh, I'm excited today we'll be talking with our state director of government affairs or our state government affairs director. I'm just reinviting your reinventing your title every time I say it, Julia. Julia Gordon, uh, our very own rock star. Uh, so so Julia, we'll get into the details of the session in a minute and some other stuff. But while we're giving people a minute, uh, how are you doing? Have you recovered from 18 hour days, seven days a week for the last three months? Our team has. It's kind of a, a slow uh, race to the finish. So that last week of session is a lot of sitting around and waiting. <laughs> so we have had time to recover and we're we're ready for, for more activity. So thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad you had to do that. I think uh, for those who've never done government affairs work, uh, I'll just use my own self, for, for example. My family is so glad I don't lobby anymore. <laughs> My sister recalls not talking to me for four months a year <laughs> during session when I used to do government affairs work. And uh, my kids remember, well, my wife remembers me like saying goodbye to my kids in January and saying hello to them again in, in May. So uh, thank you for taking that burden away from the rest of us who don't have to do that. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I think the people who I've logged in are logging in. Um, so welcome to the post-legislative CEO podcast. Um, and thank you again to our sponsor, Adesto. Uh, we uh, wanted to be live so people had questions from session, they could get answered. And we will go through those. Uh, but before we do that, let's give you a quick overview of what's been happening um, around the association. For those of you who are regular listeners to the podcast, uh, hopefully you, not, you do not get tired of me saying this. On our best day, the association does four things for the industry and for you. Um, we wanna provide an ROI to your membership. And so a little bit of uh, update on our programs. Our property and casualty affinity program has been growing. It's already met its annual goals um, because a lot of you are finding great value at it. Um, so much so that we've actually added an additional staff to take care of all of your needs. So. Um, if you're worried that our program was not gonna give you a great customer service, just know that it's growing at a rate that we've uh, added another member of the team to help you. So if you talk to Riley Flock, welcome Riley to the uh, property and casualty and uh, affinity program. Um, and we're excited about that. Uh, we also wanna be your primary source of information. And if you missed the uh, uh, webinar from Catherine Morissette and, and Kim, Kim Kamel uh, last week, check it out on our members only sites. Uh, they really did a great job of talking about all the uh, stuff around meal and rest break periods and the documentation, documentation you need to stay in compliance. Uh, there is a new round of lawyers out there going after everybody. And so hopefully you got a call from your um, territory manager, giving you a heads up on this and, and making sure you're aware of this podcast, this webinar. Um, we will put the link into this, uh, but if you're not in charge of HR or scheduling, make sure someone in your company um, has listened to this and is taking it seriously because uh, there is a rash of actions going on around meal and rest breaks. 
Government affairs we'll get to in a minute. Of course, of course we protect and enhance uh, the business climate that you do business in. But uh, we'll be talking about that in a minute. Let me get to the other one, which is we want to spotlight uh, the career opportunities in our industry through our education foundation. And uh, we're doing a, we're really excited to get that out of COVID mode and getting it into the new world. And so uh, hopefully we'll be having our new EF director. We're in the final, final stages of that. And if they're on board soon, you'll be hearing them on the podcast. Also along those lines of people getting exposed to our industry, our two pro start schools are off to nationals this weekend. So everybody wish Newport and Bonnie Lake luck as they uh, uh, compete on a national level against teams from 40 some other states. Um, and uh, thanks to all the mentors who really helped those kids get to nationals. So with that, let's talk about our fourth pillar, which is protecting and enhancing our business climate, which is done wonderfully in a really tough environment by our Director of State Government Affairs, uh, Julia Gordon. So Julia, again, welcome to the CEO podcast. Thank you. So, uh, you know, session, when, when no one's lived through a legislative session, I always try to describe it as a roller coaster, right? One day you're just hiring a mountain and you think things are going great. The other day you just question your very existence because everything's going <laughs> wrong. And then you hope the roller coaster ends in a good spot when it all settles down. So overall, how did the roller coaster ride go this session? Give us the overview of, of where it finished. Yeah, it, it was certainly a 105 day long roller coaster. <laughs> and we, I think uh, our industry fared pretty well this session. I think uh, our team is very proud of some of the accomplishments that we were able to deliver on behalf of our members. Um, there are a lot of bills I think we're going to try and quickly cover today. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then also a special session was announced for May 16th. So they are not done and we can get into um, the reasons why here <laughs> as, as we move forward. Great, because we need more legislature, right? <laughs> That's always something we're clamoring for. Right. Um, the uh, well, there was. Let's talk about what we thought was going to happen going into session. If you listen to you and I, if folks on the um, podcast today are listening, or listen to back in January, they would have heard about our top priorities and our top worries going into session. So, walk us through our top. I think we had four priorities going into session. You might correct the number. And and where did those end up? Yeah, we uh, got feedback from our members. There were a couple of areas they wanted us to work uh, in this session. Um, there's two specific to our industry, uh, tourism. So increasing tourism funding, statewide tourism promotion, um, and getting on a path that is more competitive with our neighboring states. Um, continuing the pandemic era allowances related to alcohol delivery. And then uh, we also heard overwhelmingly from our membership that the uh, housing crisis, the affordable housing crisis and the inventory crisis um, was starting to impact our workforce. Um, employees are starting to have a hard time finding housing that is close to where they work and that was starting to have an impact on workforce. And then we also heard um, very loud and clear about public safety challenges our members were having all across the state. Uh, those last two issues aren't um, necessarily an area of expertise for us, but we did engage in these areas uh, along with other organizations and coalitions and, and worked to, to make some progress. And Anthony, on that final piece, public safety is where the legislature will be coming back to deal with what's referred to as the Blake decision um, related to drug possession. And I'll just um, stray a little bit here <laughs> from our agenda. But a year or two ago, the Supreme, the state Supreme Court overturned our felony drug possession laws. Uh, the legislature came back and passed a temporary um, fix, which they were supposed to just enact kind of immediately um, and get us through a longer policy discussion about how to handle drug possession. And uh, that temporary fix expires July 1 of this year. The legislature was unable to come to an agreement around how to handle felony drug possession um, issues, charges, 
and adjourned without addressing that issue. Um, that means if they don't come to a resolution here, uh, July 1, um, essentially drug possession will be legal in Washington state. Uh, I don't think that's anything um, any lawmaker is willing to accept. So uh, they will be coming back May 16th. Uh, the governor announced he will be calling a special session. When the governor does that, um, he's able to call a special session for up to 30 days. The legislature gets to decide when they adjourn, um, but it will technically be a 30-day <laughs> session until the legislature adjourns, um, hopefully addressing that issue. Okay. Let's look, I, I want to dive deeper into a couple of those. I think uh, one, public safety, I, I, I'm trying to still come up with the right words to describe what our members are asking to do, which is really the quality of our communities, public okay. safety, housing, housing for our staff, homelessness, drug possession, some of these other issues. We really got hired to be lodging and restaurant lobbyists, and now we're finding ourselves in this community quality space, for lack of a better term. I don't know what you call it. What was the legislative reaction to see you or Denny um, or some of our other lobby, Kim, some of our other lobbying team in these conversations that weren't direct business issues? Were we welcome? Where we're like, what the hell are you doing here? How, how did the legislature react to us voicing? concerns in areas that traditionally we haven't. I think it really helped drive home the point of how um, how important these issues are to communities all across the state. I think hearing the, sort of the non-traditional voices in the public safety uh, discussions was really eye-opening for a lot of lawmakers um, that hadn't right, really fully experienced the challenge that um, families and workers are experiencing all across the state related to public safety, property crime, um, right, everything that is impacting uh, our industry. So we were, um, I think it was a bit of a surprise, but uh, uh, certainly a welcome voice in the discussions. Good. I, 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 how did the team feel on getting up to speed on, on issues that maybe we haven't studied for the last five years and really have to learn brand new things along these, these areas and, and stuff? Did the team feel comfortable in weighing in? Yeah, I mean, issues pop up every single year that we um, have never heard of or, <laughs> or haven't yeah. engaged in before. Uh, so I think we are, our team is very well equipped to, to be flexible and, and jump into a fight in any, <laughs> any topic. I, uh, let's jump to another priority, which is tourism, which was, uh, um, our top probably direct industry priority this session. Uh, we were seeking to become competitive with other states and we had a, a really aggressive, um, proposal. Um, talk about where that ended up and how does that set us up to continue to try to get competitive in the future? Yeah, so our request started out at $26 million. Um, we had a request to increase tourism funding, statewide marketing funding, $26 million per biennium. So $26 million every two years was our initial request. We ended at 9 million a biennium, which is a step forward. It's not the $26 million we were requesting, um, but a couple of things in play here. Um, the legislature is required to uh, pass a balanced budget over the two year cycle, but it needs to balance over a window of four years. So um, we're the only state that has, has that type of requirement. And the and lawmakers have to um, balance the budget based on information provided by the Economic Forecast Council. Um, that information came back, and I, I don't think it's any surprise. I think everyone's sort of expecting a, a slowdown um, in, in economic times here coming up. So that um, forecast indicated a revenue deficit coming up in the, the next biennium. So that, that made our... Um, aggressive request, <laughs> a, a little bit more difficult to accomplish, but increasing the $9 million, I think, is a, a solid step forward for our program. Um, how do we take it from here when, when our members are talking to legislators this summer? Um, the optimist 
the glass half full person could certainly say we went from a million that and a half or three million of biennium to nine. So we basically, you know, more than, I mean, simple math tripled, but I think it doesn't quite work out that way if I wasn't rounding. Um, simple math tripled the budget. Thank you for tripling our tourism budget. The glass half empty person could say, Idaho still spends more than we do. Oregon spends five times as much as we do, well, far more than five times. Um, we're, we're so far behind the other states. And they might feel like expressing frustration. We're not competitive. Um, how, when the legislator walks into the the lobby of the hotel for a rotary meeting this summer, and then the hotelier sees them and says, "Welcome to the hotel," and and let me talk to you about tourism. What would you encourage them to say to to keep us moving forward? And you know, how would they approach that? Yeah, I think there's probably two main points uh, uh, hoteliers and, and members can talk about with lawmakers to help educate them on this topic. Um, the first is related to local lodging taxes and how those are used. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around the local um, use of lodging taxes and local tourism promotion versus statewide marketing. Um, and the, the difference between those two programs. I think a lot of lawmakers look at the amount of money local municipalities get by way of lodging taxes and say, well, we've got $100 million that we spend on tourism. And that can be confusing, right? I don't think there's a, a full understanding of what um, other states do, right? Other states also have that local um, uh, addition to, you know, promoting local festivals and, um, and parades and things like that. Um, and the difference between what a statewide tourism marketing program is, right? These are larger scale. We're marketing internationally. We're marketing to folks traveling from other states, not just within. Um, and it's a lot of, uh, in addition to that, it's a lot of destination development. So I think having a conversation about what the difference is um, with lawmakers would be helpful. Um, the second thing that I think would be really helpful, uh, I think a lot of folks spend their summer and spring, um, right, doing what we do best, getting out across the state, traveling, that's leisure travel, and I don't think a lot of lawmakers who, are, who aren't engaged in tourism understand the difference between leisure travel and convention and group travel and um, the impact that that has on our industry. So I think expressing that we are still lagging really far behind in convention group business travel. Um, and that's a direct result of, of a lack of um, tourism funding uh, can be helpful for to help educate lawmakers. I think, that, I think that's really good advice because it just seems that that confusion continues. So educating that difference, I think, is, is a great counsel. Um, moving on, again, at the end of the day, we, we tripled what we had, and, 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 and that's not nothing. And, and thank you for all the work. And tourism was a major topic of conversation in the legislature throughout. So thank you for all your work and keeping it at the forefront. Um, our other big proactive issue was trying to uh, get certainty on alcohol to go moving forward. Uh, seemingly a lot of drama on that bill. Might, might have gotten more news than some of our other top priorities. Uh, where did that, where did the roller coaster stop on that one? What, what actually happened? Yeah, so exciting news. The governor set to sign the bill tomorrow. It's Senate Bill 5448. Um, this is the bill that extended our delivery um, and outdoor seating provisions that were um, authorized during the pandemic. Um, we passed House Bill 1480, I think two years ago that extended that, um, gave the LCB uh, the opportunity to kind of study and review um, any kind of public safety concerns that might have arisen from, um, from delivery and continuing that option. And then uh, we needed to come back and make adjustments if necessary to, to make those uh, issues permanent. We struggled a lot this summer with uh, third-party delivery of alcohol. Um, those companies were authorized to deliver on our behalf and did a pretty horrible job um, um, with it. So that was a huge obstacle 
Um, we did a lot of work with those companies over the interim, trying to increase compliance. Um, one company still had a zero compliance rate, meaning every time they were tested, uh, they sold to a minor. So uh, we needed to do a lot of work there. Uh, at the end of the day, those companies were just not comfortable with a requirement to have their drivers trained on how to check IDs, um, how to check for signs of intoxication, right? All of the things that our industry already does and contributes to our, our high compliance rate. Um, so that option was stripped from, um, from the allowance. So starting uh, July, 23rd, <laughs> July 1st, I'll, I'll need to double check the, the, um, the effective date. Those companies will not be able to deliver on our behalf. Um, we will still be able to do takeout. Um, we'll be able to deliver our own product and um, we'll, yeah, we'll be able to continue to delivery and to go of wine and spirits with the purchase of food and um, continue the outdoor seating uh, allowances as well. Well, great, a great win. So of our, of our top three priorities, I mean, we moved the ball forward on all of them and some of them, they got across the line. So Julia, nice, nice work on, on that. Um, let's talk about the defensive side. So on, on defense, um, again, this is a legislative review, but we could talk for hours about all the things you had to play defense. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about a couple of the, the top three or four issues you had to spend the most time <laughs> protecting the industry and explaining why our concerns were out there and where those end up. Let's start um, going into session. I think your top concern, if my memory was right, is making sure we had no new costs, no extreme tax bills or anything like that. Did anything happen to us on the tax front that we should be concerned or aware of through session? Yeah, the budget passed is is no new revenue. So that is that is very positive news um, for us. There were no um, new tax increases directed at our industry. Uh, so I think that's, that's really positive news and uh, probably a, a stronger, <laughs> a stronger fight on that front. The, the next biennium when we're uh, I think projected to be uh, in an actual recession or downturn um, in the economy, there will likely be a, a call for increased revenue, but um, we were able to avoid that this year. Awesome. As, as always, you go in a session and you don't know what's going to hit you or things you're not really concerned about all of a sudden become a major concern. And I feel like three things that definitely, let's say, took off on us, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, natural gas, VAC, and ergonomics all mm -hmm. really became um, almost centerpieces of the defense of the industry or trying to find bridges or solutions on those. Uh, which one of those would you like to start with and kind of talk about where those ended up? <laughs> where to start? I think all positive news on those fronts. So um, I think we had the most amount of member engagement related to um, the BAC bill, right? Reducing the um, threshold from 0.08 to 0.05. Uh, and so we were able to defeat that proposal this year. Uh, I think hearing really loud and clear from our industry, the impact uh, that it would have um, was really effective. I think we can also anticipate that issue to come back next year. So I think just talking about um, the fact that our industry is trained to recognize signs of intoxication, right? That's what we do. That's how we are able to serve alcohol responsibly. Um, we're able to um, identify when someone may have been overserved in slow service or cut off service and make sure that they get home safely. At 0.05, there are no physical signs of intoxication. Our industry cannot um, engage at that that level. And so um, lowering the BAC to 0.05 is really dangerous for, for our industry and our employees who are held accountable um, for over service, both criminally, um, they can be sued um, personally. So I, I think um, just being really clear that um, right, we're all for um, working towards and preventing um, drunk driving, but at 0.05, that's not um, a standard that, that there is acceptable training and that we are able to recognize signs of intoxication. Functionally, it creates a one drink per customer max. 
um, because we can't weigh customers, we can't determine their metabolism, and we know that there's a big chunk of people who could hit 0.05 at at one drink, and, and we don't know how many they've had before or came in. So um, creating a one drink max per customer, I think, would shake up a lot of people, not only in the, not only us, but a lot of the public as well. <clears throat> right. So that ended up in a good spot, but we should really prepare for more conversations this summer. What about that funny word that probably only we know the meaning of, ergonomics? <laughs> ergonomics. It uh, transferred to musculoskeletal injuries, <laughs> which is a much more difficult word to say. But Try to is, say that at point 0.08. <laughs> yeah, that is an issue that we've been working on the last several years, and we're able to come to an okay spot on, um, which I think we are we are very pleased with the work that we did with the, the prime sponsor and the legislature this year um, on that topic. But essentially what we had been trying to avoid was a one-size-fits-all um, ergonomic worker safety standard, right? Um, our industry is not an office setting, we're not a construction site. And so applying um, ergonomic rules across the board to all industries is not workable. And it's also extremely expensive um, to implement. So we've been working um, with members of the legislature on this issue. We came to a really good spot on this topic. Uh, essentially only the industries that have uh, two times the state average are eligible for any type of ergonomic rulemaking. Um, that is not our industry, right? Our industry is largely slips, trips, and, and burns, and falls, and <laughs> we do a really good job focusing on those injuries. Um, and as a result, I think our workplaces are, are very safe. And so we will not be subject to rulemaking. Um, we also were able to um, enact really, really strict um, requirements of, of labor and industries related to um, how they would adopt rules for any industry um, on, on that topic. So we were able to get to a neutral position uh, and feel good about, about where that ended up. And, and I think this is one of the issues of why, what did the association do for me? That because I don't even know the, the, the meaning of ergonomics or whatever that four word thing you said was earlier, muscular, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, they're like, well, that doesn't really concern me. But the reality is had that passed and included us, it's basically hundreds of thousands of dollars for a small business. It had the chance to be the singular biggest impact regulatory thing faced by the industry, maybe right. since healthcare. Right. I mean, I think it was back in the, 90s when, when uh, our ergonomic rulemaking was overturned by voter initiative. And um, so it's been a long time since workplaces have had to deal with a, a standard like that. And um, I think I think we're in a good spot and we're able to accomplish um, some safety measures on behalf of our industry. Well, let me let me do one more and I, and then you you tell me what else we should know. Um, and, and if people on, uh, that are able to join us live today want to ask questions of Julie and I or where things go, please do. But natural gas, I think we knew natural gas was going to be an issue. I think what maybe surprised us is how serious it became and how far fast it started moving. Um, uh, where did natural gas end up and, and what should operators be thinking about this summer and preparing for in the future? Yeah, and actually, the spill was a little bit of a surprise um, for us. We uh, were part of a coalition of other groups that were um, impacted by the State Building Code Council. They passed uh, um, a regulation this summer that essentially made it really, really difficult to install um, natural gas heating and water heaters. Um, did not ban natural gas in any way, shape, or form um, did not impact um, kitchen equipment either. Uh, and so working with this coalition to, to I think there's a, a lawsuit that has been filed um, to, to work to overturn the state building code council regulations. Uh, and then we're surprised that some of those coalition partners then introduced a bill that would essentially ban new natural gas hookups 
in Puget Sound Energy's uh, service territory, that's um, most of Western Washington. Um, more than half of our members are located in that service area, so it would have had a, a very significant impact. And I think surprisingly, it also banned um, new natural gas hookups in 90 days. Um, so it would have taken effect July 1 of this year. <laughs> And that um, obviously is extremely concerning, especially if you are in the process of expanding your business, if you're in the process of um, creating a new location in a new building, um, right? 90 days is certainly not enough time to, um, to plan accordingly. So we were able to, um, to work to, to stop that bill. A lot of engagement from our members, probably the most engagement on, on this bill and the BAC bill as well. And um, we're very pleased with the outcome there. That was one of the issues we were fighting until the very end. And um, I, I, that was probably the, <laughs> the roller coaster of the session was, was, this, was this issue. Um, after this issue, I'm gonna ask you some questions. And then if anyone has questions, they can start putting them in chat. If you're listening to this car, you're listening to the replay later and not the live version, you can email us at, um, oh, shucks, I believe it's podcast at wahospitality.org. Yep. And uh, also, any of the things we talk about are legislative wins, bill summaries um, on these key things that passed. You can find them all in the podcast note. Um, so you should be able to, if you want to learn more, um, check out the notes in the podcast when that gets released later this afternoon. Um, Natural gas moving forward, uh, there are those who feel like this is something that's coming and we can start getting proactive on it um, or we can wait for something bad to happen that wouldn't be our way. Other people feel like our industry is really a, a misunderstood. Our natural gas does not have the emissions of other natural gas equipment. Um, it's relatively... Uh, the cost of redoing this, this shouldn't be one that just is going somewhere. Are we still learning about natural gas and or do we have a sense of where the puck is going over the next year or two with this particular issue? Yeah, well, I think it's important to note that that Washington is is a very green friendly state, right, where we are um, proud of the environmental standards that that we have here in the state. It's a, a value, I think, that that we have um, for our community and our environment, right? So um, fully understand the, uh, I guess, desire to move to carbon neutral, to <laughs> um, right, treat the planet the way that it should. Uh, but there's a lot of conversation around um, the future of natural gas uh, and right, uh, Washington state passed the Climate Commitment Act, which essentially we, we need to be um, carbon neutral, reduce our carbon footprint by 2050. There's a number of standards related to that, um, which I think are, are great, positive. Um, that does not include and does not require a natural gas ban. Um, there, I think most utilities that offer natural gas um, see a path forward. Uh, continuing to offer natural gas. Um, it's really important as a uh, energy backup um, when the electrical supply, um, right, for power outages, or if there's not, um, there's not enough supply. Uh, a lot of homes use natural gas. It's affordable. Um, it's also really critical in a lot of um, cooking, uh, cultural cooking standards to um, cook with the use of a flame. And you can do that with natural gas. You can do that with wood or charcoal, which are significantly worse for air quality. Um, and so I think uh, um, the use of natural gas specifically in cooking is, uh, is critical and there's not really a need to abandon that. There's certainly um, other alternatives that are being developed, renewable natural gas, hydrogen gas. Um, and so I think we, at least our hope is we'll see a lot of um, development in those renewable options and not a um, straight out ban on a product that we need to operate um, our industry. I think that's that's good insight and to keep an eye on where that's going. I, I know that'll be a topic we talk much more about in the next few years. And so 
let's talk about we're already about a half hour of our time which goes so fast when I get to talk to you so. <laughs> there's so um, many bills <laughs> there are and we don't want to have a chance to talk about all of them each year we do a legislative review um, that we publish and we'll probably list it looks like there's about 14 bills that will actually hey, pass that will people will have to change their operations to comply with or adjust to um, when will that legislative review come out? It's out now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is that what's is that is that is the review on our website? Yes. Okay. Um, so in and uh, they'll easily be able to read through that and say, this bill means you have to change. If not, let's make sure our comm team does that. So as they're looking through it. A lot of so many bills in here that an operator could be like, I, I've gone blind. <laughs> but that it talks to all the work your team does. But let's make sure that our comm team can say, oh, this is one that means I have to change. A couple of those, um, if we wanted to highlight a couple of them, of those smaller bills that weren't those huge priority bills, but were important bills, mm -hmm. um, what ones would you highlight that people should be aware of going into the summer? Yeah, so um, House Bill 1085, I think that's the, the right number. It deals with um, single-use plastic products in hotel um, accommodations. So those single-use um, shampoo bottles, um, lotions, et cetera. Uh, there's a bill that was related to that. And I, it's, um, I think, <laughs> an example of the industry moving a certain way, um, and they're not necessarily needing to be legislation, but um, here we find ourselves working within the legislative process with the industry already moving to eliminate single use, um, those single use products. We were able to work um, really well with the sponsor on this bill, um, move the implementation date out. So uh, we have a reasonable time frame to um, get rid of those single use product, single-use plastic products, um, move to sort of the, the wall-mounted items. But the other important thing is there's been a couple of local governments that um, enacted local bans that were really unworkable, um, required a home compostable requirement, which is not a standard um, really found anywhere. This bill included a statewide preemption clause. So I think specifically in Bremerton and Bellingham, um, those local governments will be preempted from enforcing uh, the local bans that they enacted. And so I think that that is um, really, really positive news for hotel operators in, in those communities, right? We're already moving in that direction as an industry. It's something we're um, we've seen. It's a change that we're able to make to our business model um, right, we're doing it on our own without anyone telling us to do it. But um, these, I think, local governments enacted these bans without input from our industry, and we're able to, to kind of override that. So I think that's a, a bill that we're we're really pleased to see get past the finish line. I I, I love that one. I'll give one other one, and then uh, I don't, Lisa. I haven't seen any questions come into the chat, um, but if there are, um, let us know. I think my favorite bill of session outside of the, the main priority ones, um, which I'm really excited about, is that is the one that allows students um, to uh, get credit for paid work experience. Yeah. And it was brought forward by OSPI and supported by us, which really give a lot of people a chance to get exposed to our industry and get school credit and encourage people to look at us more often. Uh, when will the when will that probably take effect? Is that, is, I'm guessing, not probably rulemaking and some other stuff in front of us before that'll actually be available? Yeah, I don't know the implementation date off the top of my head, um, unless it included some kind of emergency clause. It's usually 90 days after um, the conclusion of session, which would be July 23rd. So I think it's reasonable to expect by the, the next school year um, this to be in effect and, and students being able to benefit from real world on the job experience, which can't really match. I think our industry <laughs> understands that better than than most. So, well, and attracting youth to our workforce and getting exposed to us, I believe it's every 360 hours you work in the industry, uh, you can get a credit uh, up to two credits in a time period. So, again, this is it, it'll help more people graduate. I think it'll help people more get exposed. I think it's real world life experience. So, 
Thanks to OSPI for putting that one forward. Um, please check out our legislative review on, online. Um, it is in the chat if you're listening here today live, and it'll be in the notes if you listen to this as most few hundred people do later um, and go from there. Um, Lisa, are there any questions from the group? Yes, we do have one. Uh, what is the house bill number for student work experience? 1658. All right. All uh, right. Julia, I can't thank your team enough. I know people are are so frustrated at times with the state of Washington, and, I, and we understand that frustration. Um, I know that they like, yeah, but our minimum wage and yeah, but tips. And yet, I'm not in yet. Your team does such an incredible job in such a tough environment, putting our industry forward. And so I really want the industry to know how grateful we are and, and thankful we are that your team works in a really tough environment in, in a a state that might be more proactive in progressive issues than a lot of other states. How was that? Oh, wait, nice way to say that. Um, and, and still come through this session with our industry having a great reputation, being well respected and being heard. Uh, so to your three GA chairs, um, who I probably should have you mentioned in a minute, but also to your entire team and all the grassroots and the thousands of people who made calls this session, a huge, huge thank you. Um, thank you. I should have mentioned this earlier, you're guided all these individual decisions, and I'm guessing you track close to 1,500 bills on behalf of the industry this year. Um, it's not just you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how these decisions get made? Sure. So we have a government affairs committee. We've got three chairs for that committee, uh, one full service restaurant chair, one quick service restaurant chair, and one hotel chair. Um, those uh, member volunteers, right, who volunteer their time to, to help guide our association's policy and positions. Um, Tiffany Turner with Adrift Hospitality, uh, Steve Hooper with Ethan Stoll Restaurants, and then Jen Pickett with Wen Spoke, um, Wendy's Franchisee out of, um, based in the Spokane area. And um, we ask our members to be part of the Government Affairs Committee, uh, and that requires a weekly call to review bills that have been introduced, take positions, uh, and then also provide an update, um, talk about strategy, things like that. Um, and so it, it has been um, certainly a lot of work and support from our members that volunteer their time to provide guidance. It's important for our industry. Um, so a big thank you to our Government Affairs Committee. And then our GA team is myself, um, Samantha Lauterbach, who's our Senior Manager of Government Affairs, Riley Smith, um, who's our Government Affairs Manager, and then Dale Porter, who's our Grassroots Manager. And um, we work on our state issues, and we also have a very sophisticated um, local Government Affairs team as well. Well, Julia, thank you so much. Um, if anybody has questions, let us know. Um, a lot of these things will go into action this summer. Um, and uh, we'll be then almost taking a month off, maybe, and then immediately start working on next elections and next uh, next round of issues getting ready for next session. So your job rarely has a break anymore. So <laughs> thank you. I also want to thank our, uh, our uh, sponsor, Adesso. For making this happen and all the support Adesso gives to the industry. Uh, I hope everyone has a great summer. I think we we see, I hope we see occupancy really start skyrocketing here this month in our hotels and, uh, and, and all our restaurant tables are full and we can start talking about better times and that'll be my hope and we'll see how we play out. Everyone have a great month of May and Lisa, any other final business before we say goodbye? No, just that this will be up available on our YouTube channel and our podcast channel as well. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can find the Washington Hospitality Industry Podcast. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being on and listening. It's an honor to serve you.